up there. And Thank you. Right there. Awesome. Great. Who are the other speakers been in the series? Um, building. Okay. Is that better? Yep, that's on. Well, good evening and welcome to another Crossroads of Ideas. I'm Joe Handelsman. I'm the director of the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, one of the sponsors of the Crossroads series. Uh, this is a collaboration of my institute, Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, and the Mortgage Institute for Research and the Wisconsin um, <clears throat> Alumni Research Foundation, or WARF. Uh, the idea is to address timely topics, issues that matter to all of us and that are also worked on by UW-Madison researchers. And the hope is to foster dialogue between our broader community and UW researchers. Before I go on to um, introduce the series and our speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the land that uh, this building, this discovery building lives on. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place that the nation, the Ho-Chunk nation has called De Jope for time immemorial. Decades of attempts at ethnic cleansing by both federal and state government sought to remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin, but they persisted. Ho-Chunk resilience in the face of colonization forms our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Before we hear from our speaker tonight, I want to cover a few housekeeping details. So at 45 minutes after the hour, uh, we'll go to audience Q&A. And if you're here in the room, use the mic in the middle aisle. And if you're online, please use the Q&A function in Zoom, not, um, not the chat. Uh, 
and we will read your questions aloud. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can, and then we'll conclude uh, promptly at eight. So to turn to the topic of the night, I'd like to introduce Professor Weeks. Crossroads has been a staple of Discovery Connections programming since 2014. And I think Professor Weeks is a fabulous example of what we do in this series. This year, we highlighted awardees of, uh, that have been recognized by the UW Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Education's office. And they've collaborated with us to develop this series to highlight some of their own awardees. And that's what we have uh, tonight. So Professor Jessica Weeks is a professor of political science. She's the H.H. Douglas Weaver Chair in Diplomacy and International Relations in the Department of Political Science at UW-Madison. Her research has appeared in journals, including the American Political Science Review, the Journal of Political Science, the Journal of Politics, International Organization, and World Politics. Her book, Dictators at War and Peace, explores the domestic politics of international conflict in dictatorships. Weeks was the 2018 recipient of the International Studies Association Carl Deutsch Award, which annually recognizes the scholar under 40 who's made the most significant contribution to the study of international relations that year. Professor Weeks received her bachelor's in political science from The Ohio State University in 2001, a master's degree in international history from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in 2003, and a PhD in political science from Stanford in 2009. I'm really delighted to turn the podium over to Professor Weeks, and please join me in welcoming her to the podium. All right, thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction and to those of you that are here on this cold evening and those that are uh, cozy at home on this cold evening. Um, so I am excited to talk to you today about some of my research that's been funded by WARF um, and other uh, groups at the university. Um, and I'll be undertaking the somewhat ambitious task of talking to you about three connected papers that are all around this theme of foreign, inter, uh, foreign electoral intervention and what Americans think about that. So I'll start out with a definition. So in this project, my co-author, uh, Mike Toms at Stanford and I are defining electoral intervention as when countries try to influence the outcomes of elections in other countries. You can think of other ways that countries can get involved in other countries' elections, for example, efforts to promote democracy. Um, but we're really focused here on interventions that are designed to get one candidate elected, not to build up institutions more broadly. Um, and so we've been hearing a lot about this topic in recent years, in part because the US was the target of an electoral intervention not too long ago, uh, in 2016, when Russia um, intervened on behalf of one of the candidates in the US presidential election. And, you know, it looks like there's really no end in sight to this. So an article from November of last year had one of uh, Putin's closest cronies basically uh, saying that uh, we've interfered in US elections and we're gonna keep doing so in the future. So um, the US has, has been the target of, of these kinds of efforts. What is a little bit less well known is that the US itself has also often carried out these kinds of interventions. So it was particularly common during the Cold War um, when the US and Soviet Union were sort of counter intervening in elections. They actually intervened in about one in every nine elections that took place during the Cold War. Um, uh, but that's continuing even today. So uh, on a slightly lesser scale and slightly less egregious than what they were doing uh, during the Cold War, but it's still something that's going on today. So in this project, we study how Americans think about these topics, both when the US is being targeted and when the US is the one meddling. And so there are a couple 
questions that I want to address right off the bat. So the first is why study what people in the US think about this topic. Um, and so one of the reasons is that electoral intervention is actually a very powerful form of foreign policy. Research has shown that in elections in which one side has intervened, the candidate that's being helped usually gets about a 3% boost on average. And in a close election, that could be enough to tip the balance. So this is a way for governments to pretty cheaply influence and without firing a shot, the foreign policies and domestic policy policies of other countries. So this is the stakes of understanding when this happens are pretty big. Um, you know, both for understanding when the US might do this and when other countries might do it. But foreign electoral intervention is also, um, you know, it has a lot of bad components, right? So normatively speaking, some forms of intervention are, are extremely problematic. Um, from a practical standpoint, these interventions can undermine democracy um, by reducing faith in democracy. I'll show you some results to that effect in a little while. I'll also show you that these interventions polarize the public. So depending on what side of the aisle you're on and which candidates being helped, you're going to look at the intervention very differently and not understand why your neighbor, who's maybe a member of a different political party, isn't seeing things the same way and doesn't want to respond in the same way. And then finally, these interventions can uh, increase international tensions, right? When Russia intervened in our elections, we weren't too thrilled about it. And so understanding what the US thinks about this is important, not just for understanding when the US will intervene, but also because what the US does is important. The US is a global superpower. What the US does shapes global patterns, uh, global norms, things like that. So I think studying the US is obviously important. But then you might wonder, well, why study what ordinary Americans think since most Americans are not the ones carrying out these interventions. So I wanna, wanna um, explain why we do that. So, we think this, that understanding what the public thinks is helpful for a few things. So first it sheds light on the incentives of leaders, uh, both to intervene in other countries' elections and also to solicit foreign intervention in US elections. So if we know that there's gonna be a public outcry, if a leader does this, then we can learn that leaders will either have incentives to avoid that kind of activity or to push it underground and do it covertly. If it turns out that Americans don't really care, then we'll see those kinds of interventions maybe more often uh, and, and more out in the open. So by looking at this, we can understand what leaders have incentives to do. Uh, it also helps us understand the quality of representation, right? So I just mentioned that the US intervenes actually quite frequently in foreign elections. Um, so we would like to know, well, is this something that the US public would have a problem with if it were being consulted about this directly? Understanding what the public thinks can also shed light on what leaders think. So there's a growing body of research that shows that even though leaders have different backgrounds and experiences than ordinary citizens, they actually tend to respond, especially in sort of experimental work, which is what I'll be showing you today, in quite similar ways. So we can't be sure that leaders would react the same ways to the scenarios that we present them with, but past research suggests that we can at least learn clues. So we can look at how leaders might think or guess about how what leaders might think or do, even if they weren't worried about what the public was, uh, how the public would respond, maybe because they're keeping something covert. Um, and then finally, we put all this together, studying these questions can tell us about the future of democracy and whether domestic public opinion in the US is going to provide pushback against leaders that uh, invite intervention in our elections or that intervene in others. So we are gonna use experiments in this project to study three questions related to what I've just laid out. So we're gonna study how Americans react first when foreign countries intervene in US elections. So along the lines of the 2016 Russian intervention. We'll look at how um, Americans react when US presidential candidates solicit foreign intervention in US elections, which happened uh, a few years after that in 2019. But we'll, we'll try to draw broader lessons than just looking at one historical episode. And then also how the public reacts when the US intervenes in foreign elections. And um, so we think these are really important topics and, and actually we know extremely little about them. So we're kind of walking into a fresh field there. So the first paper that I'll tell you about looks at that first question, reactions to foreign meddling in US elections. And so that paper has actually been published. It came out in the American Political Science Review a couple of years ago. And so our goal in this paper was to study how Americans react when foreign countries get involved in US elections. 
We recruited about 3,000 online respondents in 2018. Um, we found a sample that was representative on key demographics like age and gender, geography, race. So we feel that we can generalize pretty well about how Americans overall react to this kind of thing. And then we presented subjects with a hypothetical situation set in 2024 during that future US presidential election. Um, and so what we did here is we used a technique called survey experiments, where we essentially field a survey and then we embed in that survey experimental manipulations to see how subjects respond to different kinds of information. So like all experiments, there's random assignment of key treatments. So what we randomly assigned here is first of all, what the foreign country did. So in all scenarios, subjects learned that there was a foreign country um, and that was either decided to intervene or decided not to intervene. So in the stay out condition, the foreign country kind of thought about it and then ultimately declined to intervene. In other scenarios, subjects learned that the foreign country had endorsed one of the US candidates. And so by endorse, we basically mean that the foreign country expressed a preference um, saying, hey, we really like um, you know, this candidate, um, but didn't couple that with any kind of explicit goodies or threats. So it didn't say if, if you don't elect this person, you know, this bad thing will happen or this good thing will happen. Um, threats sort of up the ante a little. So they have a, they combine a verbal endorsement. We really like Donald Trump or we really like Hillary Clinton with some sort of threat. And, and if you don't elect him, then we're gonna have to rethink our relations with the US. Um, or in other scenarios, subjects read that the foreign country had engaged in what we call an operation. So operations are things like giving money uh, to one of the candidates, spreading truthful information about a candidate, something that's embarrassing, but maybe not widely known, spreading malicious lies about a candidate, um, or at the extreme hacking into voting machines and altering vote tallies. So like undermining the very machinery of voting. So first thing we randomly assign is this, what the, what the foreign country did. We then also randomly assign which party, Democrat or Republican, the foreign country was trying to help through its intervention. So subjects randomly read, it was either a Democratic candidate or a Republican candidate. Other things we randomize that aren't quite as uh, important from a theoretical standpoint are which country intervened. We had a, a list of countries that we randomized across to not make our experiment too specific to just one country. Russia was not one of them, given that, that intervention had happened pretty recently, we kind of wanted to abstract away from that situation. And we also varied certainty about who the perpetrator was, what the, what the identity of the country was, not whether the intervention happened, but who was responsible for it, to sort of see how that affects retaliation. Okay, so, so after reading, after exposing subjects to the scenario with these randomized manipulations, then we measured three key sets of outcomes or uh, reactions. The first was disapproval of what the country did. Um, you know, we didn't know ex ante, would the US, would Americans disapprove of all of these things or only some of them? Second, a, a variety of measures of confidence in US democracy, things ranging from uh, trust in the current election results all the way to deeper faith in democratic institutions and willingness to vote down the road. Um, and then also finally support for various forms of US retaliation against the country that had intervened in the election. That's okay, so um, you know, I'll, I'll sort of breeze through a bird's eye view of our main findings from this paper. So our first finding is that Americans tended to disapprove of all forms of intervention except for endorsements, which you can see here, um, they largely thought were okay. So the, the dependent uh, variable that we're looking at here is level of disapproval. Here operationalizes the percentage percent of our subjects that disapproved. So only 30% disapproved of endorsements. Apparently Americans think that it's okay for foreign countries to express their opinion about a candidate as long as that's not coupled with some kind of carrot or stick. But we see as the intervention sort of gets um, more intrusive. So for example, when, um, when the foreign country issued a threat, we flip to a majority disapproval with 55% disapproving. And then disapproval increases up to an average about 77% for operations. Um, one thing that we thought was interesting here is that Americans didn't show a sharp distinction between spreading truth and spreading lies. So it's hard to know upfront how Americans would react to that. They might welcome 
any actor exposing truthful, relevant information about a candidate, but no, um, Americans did not like that at all. They thought that was almost as bad as spreading lies and in fact, almost as bad as hacking into voting machines. So we sort of interpret that as the norm of sovereignty, um, you know, non-intervention in domestic affairs rearing its head. Um, so the similarity between those different um, forms of intervention was interesting. Okay. The second set of patterns that we looked at were how these uh, reactions varied by party. So this figure shows, again, the same outcome measure, disapproval, and it's broken down in the following ways. So these columns here show um, the grouping of what the foreign country did. So the first column shows endorsements, second column shows threats, third column shows operations. So you always wanna read down the columns. Um, it also breaks this down by the party of the voter. So here's disapproval among Republican voters, here's disapproval among independents, and here among Democrats. And then finally, which side the foreign country favored. And for this experiment, we always had the country, sorry, the, the party that the foreign country favored win the election in the end. So those were paired together. Um, and we compared that to what happened when the foreign country didn't intervene and the uh, same candidate won when we compared it to the control condition. Okay, so here we're just gonna zoom in on threats. You know, we could hone in on any one of these patterns, but we'll start by looking at double standards among Republican voters. And so what we see here is that when the foreign country favored the Republican candidate, and this is averaging over the identity of the foreign country, um, but looking just at threats, then we see that 51% of Republicans disapproved, but that jumped up to 71% when the other, when the foreign country favored the Democrat. But lest you think that the Republicans were, um, you know, bad and the Democrats were somehow angels, uh, you see the exact same thing, actually slightly worse, um, among the Democrats. So you see that when the foreign country made a threat designed to help a Democratic candidate, only 39% disapproved, and that um, went all the way up to 71% when the foreign country helped a Republican. So huge double standards on this, um, and, and we think it's really interesting that those double standards went both ways. So you know, if you think about 2016 and, and what reactions might have been if the shoe had been on the other foot, this tells us that we might have seen something kind of similar to what we observed um, in that year. Okay, um, third, we explored how intervention shaped attitudes about democracy. And so I mentioned we had a, a several different measures of this, and here the news was really, uh, again, not good. So this figure shows what percent of Americans said that they would distrust the results of the election um, based on the experimental condition that they were in, averaging across everything else in the experiment. So grouping together party um, identity of the foreign country. So. I don't know if you think this is good or bad news that 25% of Americans said that they would distrust the results in, um, yeah, in the stay out condition when the foreign country didn't intervene. So that's sort of our baseline measure of dist distrust. It's not terribly surprising from the standpoint of literature that has found that the losers of elections, you know, half of the, uh, you know, a big proportion of the sample will have learned that its side lost the election. So that could be driving some of that. But that distrust went up sharply when the foreign country intervened. So 38% distrust when there was an endorsement, 42 for a threat to an average of 71% distrusting the electoral results when there was an operation. So even if the foreign country sped, spread truthful information, the, a lot of distrust. We um, also looked at other outcomes. So we looked at Americans uh, whether Americans thought that they would lose faith in democracy more broadly as a system of government. We found similar depressing patterns and also whether they said that they would avoid voting. And we saw that that um, learning about an intervention really depressed uh, intention to vote. And then again, sort of in line with the previous slide, all of these perceptions were strongly affected by partisanship. So Americans were much more likely to distrust the results, lose faith in democracy, say they would avoid voting if the foreign country helped their political opponent than if the foreign country helped their side. So again, you can imagine how the debates that could ensue after an intervention could be highly polarized with different uh, parties, people from different parties just looking at the same situation very differently. 
Finally, we looked at retaliation. And so here we found, I think pretty interestingly, that Americans were hesitant to retaliate. So we asked about four different possible forms of retaliation. So imposing diplomatic sanctions on the foreign country that had intervened, imposing economic sanctions, making military threats, or at the extreme, a military strike on the foreign country. So here I'll just summarize our results verbally. So Americans did not support any form of retaliation for the sort of lowest levels of foreign intervention. So when the foreign country endorsed a candidate or made threats, endorsed and made a threat, the Americans never were even willing to impose diplomatic sanctions, which is interesting because most Americans did disapprove of threats, for example. Maybe it's not so surprising for endorsements where Americans were pretty tolerant, more surprising for threats. Um, if the foreign country did the worst things, the operations like giving money, spreading true or false information, or hacking into voting machines, then Americans were willing to support, or a majority was willing to support economic or diplomatic sanctions. But under no conditions, even when the foreign country hacked into voting machines, would Americans support military threats or, um, or uh, use of military force. So what we interpret this as um, is kind of that foreign countries can, I mean, they could hack into US voting machines, like seize control of our, our uh, choice of leader and in the process divide the electorate, the US electorate, that's gonna be very polarized about what happened, weaken our political system um, and, and at worst maybe get some economic sanctions slapped on them. So that, appears to be not just something that happened in 2016, this seems like it would happen even if we were in a different situation with a different foreign country intervening, a different political party being helped, you know, the foreign country doing other things. So we take this as pretty um, depressing news um, for, for the future. Um, and if you're one of our foreign rivals, maybe good news, because you're like, hmm, okay, I know what to do now. Um, so the second question that we looked at is, is related to this one, which is how do American voters react when US candidates solicit foreign help? So the fact that intervention can, by definition, help one of the candidates can give candidates an incentive to seek that kind of help. Um, and knowing when candidates will do that is important because research has shown that intervention happens rarely unless there is some sort of on the ground cooperation with either the candidate or, or parties close to the candidate. And so we would wanna know about the conditions that would increase that kind of local cooperation. But soliciting could also have potential downsides, right? If you're caught and it turns out that the public doesn't like it, um, then you could really suffer uh, and not yield that, that benefit of the help of the money of the endorsement or whatever it is. So we, for this reason, asked to what extent do voters actually punish candidates who solicit um, versus staying loyal to candidates um, because they maybe want a certain party to, to be in office. We also look at and you know, in the paper, we go into a lot of theory about what, what we think might influence this, but we look at several factors. So um, is it a function of the relationship with the foreign country, whether we're friendly or not so friendly with the foreign country? Is it a function of whether the candidate offered a quid pro quo? Like, does it matter if you offer something in return, like the Democrats argued in 2019, or is that sort of beside the point? Soliciting is always bad. Um, and then also partisanship. And so here we're particularly interested in whether there's a difference between Democratic and Republican voters given the strong stance that Democrats took on this issue in 2019. So again, we use experiments to study this because of course we can observe what happened in 2019 and draw some conclusions from that, but we just don't know again, whether things would have been different if it were a different country that was being solicited. Here it was Ukraine, a friend, um, would, would the reaction have been different if it had been an, uh, an enemy? Um, we don't know whether the reaction would have been different if it had been a Democrat or if the request had been something different or if there had been no appearance of a quid pro quo. So we again fielded a series of experiments to figure this out. So these are hot off the press. We just fielded these um, in the last two months. So we fielded three online experiments on about 8,000 US respondents. and. We sort of similar to 
the first set of experiments, we asked participants to read about a hypothetical scenario involving the 2024 uh, US presidential election. And so for each scenario, subjects got several scenarios, we randomly paired a Democratic candidate, a real candidate, I'll describe in a moment, against a Republican candidate. So among the four Democrats that we included in our experiments were Biden, Buttigieg, Harris, and Sanders. And among the Republicans were Cruz, DeSantis, Pence, and Trump. So you're, 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 you happen on our experiment on the internet, um, you would maybe get a, a situation in which Buttigieg is running against Cruz and a different situation in which Sanders is running against Trump. Um, and then be asked questions about that. So we again had a control condition that we compared to various treatment conditions. Here, the control condition is that we made no mention of anyone, neither of the candidates seeking foreign help in the election. In the treatment conditions, one of the candidates asked a foreign country to get involved in some ways, and, uh, in some way. And so we randomized there which candidate it was that asked, whether it was the Democrat or Republican, which country they contacted, what exactly they asked the foreign country to do, and whether they offered anything in return, so gave a quid pro quo, and if so, what that was. So just a little bit more detail. <clears throat> I mentioned we randomized the identity of the target country. In one of the treatment scenarios that each subject read, they learned that the candidate had asked an ally for help. So the ally was either Australia, Canada, France, Japan, or the UK. And in the other scenario, the, the candidate asked a non-ally for help, so China, Iran, North Korea, Russia, or Syria. I mentioned we also randomized the nature of the request. So you can just focus on the bold text here in the interest of time. So these are kind of similar to the, the things that we asked about in our first experiment. Um, the candidate either asked for a verbal endorsement uh, or it, it, operationalizing threats was kind of tricky. So we didn't do that, I could explain why, but. Um, or sort of operations um, similar to the type that we talked about earlier. So they, uh, the for, they either asked the foreign country to buy ads that would boost turnout among key groups, to buy ads that would praise the candidate, to buy negative ads that would say bad things about the candidate, or to open an, an investigation. Um, in half of the, the treatment conditions that subjects receive, the candidate offered a quid pro quo, basically off said that if they were elected, if the intervention worked, they would return the favor by giving some sort of diplomatic perks, like a White House visit, giving economic perks, which we operationalized as signing a trade agreement, giving, we call this institutional perks, or promising to help the, the foreign country in the UN, or redeploying US military forces in a way that would benefit the, the foreign country. So after reading all that, then we measured two dependent variables, two outcomes, their preference about the candidates. So which of the two candidates um, would they prefer? And also their vote choice, because you know, it might not be that a, a voter would be willing to switch from like Biden to Trump or Trump to Biden, but maybe they would stay home. And so the second dependent variable picks that up. Now, it turns out that how you operationalize this doesn't change any of the substantive conclusions. And this first variable is just sort of easier and more intuitive to explain and operationalize. So I'll be showing you these results, but the, the substance of what we find is, is the same when we look at this other, um, maybe more politically consequential outcome. Okay, last detail of the experiment. We actually fielded three closely related versions of the experiment. Because something that we know can happen in these situations is that there can be um, elites rushing to the defense of the candidate and there can be uncertainty about what happened. So in the first experiment, we call it the pure solicit solicitation experiment. We just informed subjects, here's what happened. And we didn't mention anything about elites. We didn't say, and the Democratic Party defended Pete Buttigieg you know, for what he did. In the second experiment, the elite justification experiment, we presented the scenario as a fact again, but we had party elites weigh in. So if a Republican candidate solicited, then we would have Republican elites defend the candidate and say, they didn't do anything wrong, it was perfectly appropriate. And the Democrats would weigh in and said, no, it was terrible. So they got kind of two-sided rhetoric about what had happened. And then finally, in the contested report condition, we injected some uncertainty about what had happened. So instead of telling subjects, here's what occurred, 
we told them the FBI released a report or the intelligence services released a report. It had moderate confidence that this happened. Um, and we know that intelligence agencies issue reports with varying levels of confidence. In fact, um, there was just a report today or yesterday about low confidence, right, about the COVID lab leak theory. So uh, we know that, that, that this happens. It's kind of, you know, intelligence agencies will weigh in even if they're not 100% sure. Okay, and, uh, and so, you know, we, we predict that elites weighing in the rhetoric, but also the uncertainty diminishes punishment and also um, exacerbates sort of partisan tensions. Okay, so I'm gonna try to cruise through our main findings. So the first finding is that voters were largely unwilling to punish. So, you know, it's hard to say, and I'll just sort of preface this by saying, this is a glass half empty, half full kind of situation. Um, so on the glass half empty side, the overwhelming majority of voters in each party didn't change their vote. And this was partly because opponents were already voting against the candidate, right? So Democrats were already voting, voting against a Republican candidate, Republicans were already voting against a Democratic candidate. So they're not imposing any punishment, but also because the um, members of the candidate's own party usually stayed loyal, like 80, 90% of them. Um, and so, when you factor that all together, we saw about 9% of voters being willing to punish in that pure solicitation scenario where there's no elite rhetoric and no uncertainty. So 91% of voters not changing their vote. That dropped to 6% in the elite justification condition. So when elites rushed to the candidate's defense, this dropped punishment a bit. Um, and it was 7% in the contested report condition where there was this report or I didn't mention that there was also, the, the report was contested, um, or sorry, it was uncertain. So it had moderate confidence. And also there was sort of partisan squabbling saying like, oh, this is a smear job. No, it's not um, the kind of thing you'd be likely to see. Okay, so low punishment on average, this is averaging across quid pro quos and whether it was an ally or an enemy. We also found that candidates could reduce the costs if they asked an ally. Um, and if they avoided the appearance of a quid pro quo. So that dropped punishment on average by another couple to few percentage points. Um, and of course the expected cost for a candidate would be even lower because if they felt that they could either avoid detection, right? Cause this, these penalties are only occurring if the public hears about it or if they thought they could delay it till after the election and then other political events take over the news cycle. So, you could see this all as really terrible news. Glass half full, you know, 9%, 6%, even in, in the smaller, even if you asked an ally without a quid pro quo, like 5%, that would make the difference in most elections in the last 30 years. Not most elections in the last century. There have been some real landslides, but in a close election that, that could do it. Um, so, so, you know, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts about whether this is encouraging or discouraging. We also had a surprising party uh, finding about punishment by party. So we had gone into this hypothesizing that Democratic voters would impose more punishment on Democratic candidates because of all the rhetoric from 2019. I mean, Democrats impeached a president because they said that president solicited help from Ukraine in the election. Um, it turns out that Democrats and Republicans punished their own at identical rates. There was literally no detectable difference between the two. Um, a different way that party could matter though is not sort of average punishment being different across the parties, but back to that idea of partisan double standards and polarization and seeing things differently depending on which side of the aisle you're on. So here we're looking not at punishment, but we're looking again at disapproval of what the candidate had done. And so what we see, let's start with Democratic voters. So the blue uh, oval up here. What we see is that disapproval was 67% when a Democratic did, candidate did this, but 83% when it was a Republican candidate. Likewise, Republican voters 
uh, disapproved at a rate of 61 versus 82. Now, this is also interesting when you take into account how low punishment was. This shows you that voters did not like this, but they stood by their candidate anyway. That's how you only get the 9% punishment. So that's also sort of glass half empty kind of situation. Um, and so what this, and we, we saw similar double standards about judgments like whether the behavior was unethical, whether it was illegal, which you think would be a black and white issue, no, no, <laughs> like major disagreement, um, and whether it threatened the US interests and security. And so what this means, so now showing the same data, but just sort of making a different comparison, is that there could be a lot of partisan disagreement about specific cases. So let's say, for example, let's look at the blue line. Let's look at what would happen if a Democratic candidate solicited Democrats would disapprove, they would disapprove a lot, 67%, but that would be even larger, um, that disapproval would be even larger among Republican voters. So the Republican side of the aisle screaming bloody murder, Democrats a little more moderate. Likewise, if a Republican candidate solicited, Republican candidates would, you know, Republican voters would be unhappy, but um, Democrats would be much more unhappy. And we saw similar perceptions again with things like perceptions of ethics and legality and, and all of those questions. What we also saw is that elite justifications about what had occurred made these partisan splits even bigger. And what we think is going on there is that, um, let's say a Democratic candidate solicits, Democratic elites defend the Democrat, Republican elites criticize the Democrat. That's persuasive to Democratic voters who are like, okay, I, I, I'm let off the hook. I don't need to punish the, you know, my leadership. So this is fine, but the Republicans don't change their mind at all. So the rhetoric is sort of differentially persuasive. And so it pushes these, um, the disapproval even further apart. So like here you have Republican voters, less than half of them disapproving if a Republican candidate solicits and the Republicans defend the candidate and 81% disapproving when it's a Democrat. You see similar things on those other dependent variables. And then again, you just have these huge partisan splits and like whether this was a bad thing, which would affect things like um, willingness to punish the, the candidate um, either formally or, or informally. Um, okay, so takeaways here, most will, voters unwilling to punish ultimately, right? Between 94 and, um, and between like 91 and 94%, even less uh, in some of the conditions. Democrats, no more punitive than Republicans. Candidates could minimize the punishment through these um, tactics like asking allies, avoiding quid pro quos, getting elites to defend them, casting doubt on what happened. Um, but the hopeful note, a small minority would punish um, and, and that minority could be pivotal in a close election. Okay. Finally, I'm gonna talk for four minutes about the final question, which is how do Americans react when the shoe is on the other, other foot and it's the US meddling in a foreign country's election. So as I mentioned, the US has a long history of doing this, notably during the Cold War, but even today. Um, and we do it because it can advance the US national interest, but it also has these bad out outcomes, you know, undermining values, harming democracy, making tensions worse. So we ask, how do Americans react when the US is the one meddling? And basically, is there a reason to think that public opinion could provide a check on leaders doing this, or could it even incentivize leaders meddling? Um, so again, we ran an experiment. This one was back in 2020. Um, we again uh, described an election, but this time it was a foreign election. So the election was happening um, in a foreign country, and there were two candidates. One that was pro-US and that one that was pro a, a US rival. And, and the rival was either China or Russia. We randomized where that foreign election took place. So here's the list of countries. We, we focused on countries that most people would agree are democratic. You know, it's also interesting to, to know how Americans would react to US meddling in sort of flawed elections. But for, for now, we're just looking at democracies. So. For example, you're looking, uh, you were reading a scenario about an election in Argentina between a candidate that was pro-US and a candidate that was either pro-Chinese or, or pro-Russian. Uh, we also randomized what the US did. So 
in some that the, the control condition in the control condition, the US did not intervene, it just allowed the election to run its course. And then we informed subjects which candidate won. We randomized the behavior of the rival country. So China or Russia, um, did they intervene? Same things, same kinds of things we've been looking at so far. We randomized the, who won the election, as I mentioned, um, either the pro-US candidate or the pro-rival candidate. And then we randomized whether the US president was a Democrat or Republican, because maybe subjects are more forgiving when their own party does this than when the opponent does it. Okay, so some key findings. So kind of as with what we saw earlier where Americans disapproved when candidates solicited, Americans tended to be sort of morally suspicious of intervention, um, especially again, the, the more serious intrusive forms of intervention but they tended to tolerate it anyway. So I'm gonna show you a figure that plots approval this time. So we're kind of flipping it, um, it for this figure. So this is a scale of approval. It kind of tells you average approval across the electorate. And the way to read this is um, the left column, and that's just what we'll focus on for now, is when the rival country, either China or Russia, stayed out of the election. And the dots, so each of the rows here shows us a different US action. So here's the control condition when the US stayed out. Here's when the US endorsed a foreign candidate. Here's when the US made a threat. Here's what we call, we distinguished here between different kinds of operations. We kind of got into the weeds on that. So we had either sort of lower deception operations um, like giving money, spreading information, boosting turnout, and then what we called high deception operations like hacking or spreading lies. Um, you could maybe quibble with those categories, but the, the reactions kind of group in this way. Um, and then finally, the dots here, the color of the dots tells you whether the pro-US candidate won or the pro-US candidate lost. Okay, so in my final seconds, I will just say, a few, I'll point out a few things. So first of all, Americans always liked it more when the pro-US candidate won, not shocking. Um, but this difference was especially big in the stay out condition. And approval, um, and this is sort of important because this middling approval in the stay out condition when the US candidate lost, it turns out can create some incentives for leaders to gamble on getting the good black outcome in one of the um, intervention conditions. Another thing to see is that you know, we, we interpret 50, a score of 50 here being sort of US voters condoning the, the, the intervention. And what we see is, especially when the US candidate won, um, Americans are pretty much okay with this. Um, the, the big exception being high deception operations like hacking and spreading lies. Americans always thought that was bad. Um, and then finally, what the rival did really shaped reactions where all across the intervention conditions, these points shift rightward when China or Russia was intervening in the election. So um, let's take uh, low deception operation in Argentina, and let's say China did not intervene. If you hold constant the outcome, Americans were much more supportive of US, the US carrying out this operation when China was meddling too. Okay, so um, I've, uh, I've mentioned all of these. So Americans often tolerated it, especially when the foreign rival won. Um, last thing I'll say is that we use these measures of ex post approval. So how did Americans react when the US did this to calculate what the ex ante incentives of leaders would be like, so a leader's trying to look down the game tree and say, what's going to maximize my approval. And what we found is because of that low approval, when the US lost in the state and stayed out, basically allowed a foreign um, a, a rival to, to win an election. Because of that, leaders can actually often maximize their approval by intervening and hoping that that will tip the balance in the election and get them that boost from um, the favorable foreign electoral outcome. Um, this could also provide incentives to intervene covertly to make it seem like you stayed out and the US candidate, pro US candidate won, but actually intervene and, and just make it look like that's what happened. Um, and we found these uh, incentives to meddle were especially strong when the rival meddles. Here we also found some interesting um, partisan gaps. It's hard to know. Um, it's not super consistent across the studies, but here we did find that Republicans were a little more favorable towards foreign intervention. So putting this all together, 
meddling is destructive. It, it um, harms democracy. It um, makes people disagree and it's polarizing because partisans disagree about what happened, but voters aren't that enthusiastic about retaliating. Um, second, we found that voters are pretty tolerant when politicians solicit, um, and that's true even when there's zero doubt about what happened. Um, and especially under these conditions that I already talked about, like soliciting from allies. And then finally, voters are pretty tolerant when the US meddles, um, especially when the foreign rival is meddling too. So that's the third study. So we interpret this as suggesting that global meddling, except for maybe those most deceptive modes, the hacking um, and spreading lies, is, but even that, um, you know, relies on detection that suggests that meddling might be here to stay. Both foreign countries meddling in our elections um, because of the findings from the first study where you know, we're just not that enthusiastic about punishing it, but also the US, US candidates potentially inviting meddling and, and meddling in the elections of other countries. Um, so I will stop there and I, I really look forward to your questions and um, any insights you have. Yeah, um, this is certainly a very interesting topic. Um, to be frank, I found it a little disappointing that you're uh, focusing strictly on hypothetical uh, situations when I think that there's a whole lot out there that could be uh, researched on actual uh, um, efforts by the US to uh, intervene uh, in foreign elections, which has been going on, I think, doubtlessly since the end of World War II. So, so I'm thinking that that might have been a better use of your time and effort to research uh, things like that. Then the other concern I have is, I, I think it's very unlikely that foreign countries are gonna overtly uh, support or endorse a candidate in the US election. I think it's more likely that if they wanna do influence buying, they're gonna try things like uh, what uh, Hunter Biden is accused of doing where they give him very favorable uh, business deals and opportunities. And the same was true to a lesser extent. If you remember back with uh, Billy Carter, where uh, the Libyans were trying to court influence uh, through him ridiculous though that sounds. But I guess my point is, um, could you comment a little more about uh, if any of your research touched on questions of actual US efforts at uh, interfering in elections abroad and also other examples of foreign countries trying influence peddling along the lines of either Hunter Biden or uh, Billy Carter or others. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for engaging with this. Um, I think your two questions are actually connected to each other um, and speak to a sort of division of labor in the field. So I completely agree that it's crucial to study what actually happened. And that is something that scholars are doing. So documenting cases of um, actual US intervention and trying to see how, uh, what effects that produced, how people reacted to that, whether candidates or politicians were punished for doing that. The problem with drawing firm conclusions about that is that those interventions are all strategic. They're not, they don't represent the full spectrum of what leaders and countries could do. They don't arise randomly, right? Because countries are intervening in elections when they don't expect punishment. They're soliciting foreign help when they don't think they're gonna get backlash. Um, and so we can't just look at the cases that did occur. They, they can tell us something. They can certainly give us ideas. And in fact, a lot of our hypotheses were inspired by reactions that we saw, but there would be no way to study whether Democratic versus Republican backlash would be different against a candidate that solicited just by looking at um, actual cases of that. Because even if we had enough cases to compare, they would be so different on so many dimensions. So I hear what you're saying, but I would defend pretty strongly the idea that hypotheticals and experiments, they give us leverage into um, that question. 
at, you know, what, what the reactions would be. And that, that connects to your second question, which was saying that you think it's unlikely that a foreign country would intervene overtly um, in the US. And I agree, our findings suggest that that would be less likely than other forms of intervention. And one of the reasons is that it would, that it would, elicit, um, it would elicit more retaliation than, than um, if the public didn't know about it because the public mo would mobilize more for sanctions, for example. Um, but studying what the consequences of that would be helps us learn about whether how, how terrible it would be, how much would it hurt democracy if a foreign country did that and the public learned about it? And so how much should we invest in hardening our infrastructure against that kind of thing or, or um, educating Americans about the, the possibility of that? So I, I think it's important to do both, but I think there is value in, in this kind of experimental exercise, but happy to chat with you more about that for sure. Hello, Hi. Uh, that's a, there's a lot to unpack here. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things I was really surprised by was like how cheap it is. Like there's yeah. almost no consequences. It's like, oh, we hacked all your voting machines and changed the numbers and uh, <laughs> kind of that mm -hmm. that impact um, was really stunning to me. I'm I'm kind of, or even just like um, uh, bringing up the, the plausibility of, uh, is this report contested or not? Yeah. Um, how do you how do you see um, these systems like um, like social media or especially now it's gaining some traction like these generative AI systems in um, having this kind of like force multiplier effect on being able to like uh, have these interventions take place with you know the the cost like the yeah. financial cost is very low and then if the punishments are very low if you can target these people so effectively um, how do you foresee us being able to either um, uh, fend off that or try and think about um, how we uh, digest this information differently. Right. So I think you, you pointed to sort of two different kinds of costs. One is the cost in terms of retaliation or consequences if something is unveiled. You know, will, you, will the public turn against you if you're a candidate or will the public want to retaliate if you're a country, foreign country intervening in the US. Um, and then the other cost I think you also alluded to is how much it actually costs to create the intervention. And I think um, on both counts, the so social media and AI are just making this even easier, right? So um, incredibly inexpensive. I mean, Russia's operation in 2016 was on a shoestring budget and then affected US politics for the foreseeable future um uh and you know any kind of the social media so that intervention use social media but um i don't think you know the social media companies are trying to tamp down on that um but that ties to the second cost which is the cost of retaliation and so when you have have something as widespread as social media being infiltrated by a foreign country, then first of all, it's hard to detect sometimes. Um, we're getting better at that and companies are investing in that. But then you have to um, tell Americans that they've basically been duped and they don't want to hear that, right? So spreading information about the intervention is itself like offensive and Americans go like this. So if you wanna rally support for retaliation, you're gonna have a lot of people that sort of have motivated reasons not to be interested in that. So um, yeah, so there's really interesting technical work happening about how to approach this from a technical standpoint. Um, there's also, I mean, I think an interesting question that my co-author Mike Toms and I are, are interested in looking at is what kinds of, um, how can you teach people about this in a way that doesn't make them defensive? If, for example, they've been a target. So that could couple with some of the technical um, enhancements. But yeah, I think you've put your finger on the fact that <laughs> we should be worried. Yeah. I think one thing I've noticed above all else is that a lot of the uh, average people who are affected by this, they're not being affected so much by um, a big state media company. They're being affected by the 
uh, by the average person in the countries that are uh, influencing elections. I mean, I, I moderate a number of Facebook groups, and I think that while a lot of the uh, you know misinformation is spread by bots, I think some of it's also spread by just average people, and a big part from what I can see of um, the challenge in dealing with this does seem to be separating um, the average person just sharing their opinion in a way that looks like it could potentially be interference from uh, bots because they can look very similar. And I really, as a human being, I'm looking at these bots, these people trying to get into this group, and I can't tell the difference until they start posting things that make them look like a bot. Their profiles look identical to any normal person they're made 10 years ago. Yeah. So I guess my question is, um, uh, what's the solution, do you think? Yeah. Um, I don't know what the solution is. I would say that that is a fascinating question, right? So the interventions of we, as we are describing them in our experiments are government directed explicitly. It is the government of China or whatever um, creating the intervention and you're describing the fact that given social media is sort of connecting to your question too, um, you could have foreign voices influencing what Americans learn or believe, even without malicious direction by a foreign country. My right, right, right. So it could be happening. Um, I mean, it could be legit, and it could be legitimate free speech. Um, so it. My speculation would be that it has some of the pernicious effects in terms of being polarizing and demoralizing to Americans, but that you would have even lower support for retaliation because there's no bad guy to you know, uh, drop economic sanctions on. And, and like I said, it could be legitimate. So uh, that's really interesting. Right, and there's that confusion exactly about whether it's a bot or an individual. One last question before we finish. How do you make your 8,000 person sample representative of oh, the US public? Okay, so now we're gonna get into um, just sort of some of the minutia of how this works. So um, there are different ways that, that survey providers sample. Some of them basically use techniques from um, traditional sampling where they'll like use random digit dialing and try to generate a a truly representative random sample of the, the sort of gold standard that sampling theory is built on, but that is extremely expensive. Um, so to make the research more cost effective, what companies do now is these are largely opt-in samples and they use quotas to make the sample look like um, it is representative. So you basically look at the census and you say, okay, I should have about 51% female, this percent from different geographic regions, this percent, um, you know, whatever other benchmarks you want to use, maybe political party. Um, and then, then you would sort of, um, you would, uh, you would call your sample from all the possible people out on the internet to look like that group and just have um, those individuals take your survey. Now, it sounds like that could be create a lot of bias, but research has shown that these kinds of sort of opt-in convenient samples are actually tend to produce similar results as the really, really expensive samples. Um, but yeah, it, it, if the person wants to learn more, I can get into all the geeky details. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I invite all of you to join us again for Crossroads next month. Uh, we'll be talking about nuclear energy. And join me again in thanking Professor Weeks one more time for a great presentation. Thank you. Thanks for your uh, terrific and, I think, research-inspiring questions. I really appreciate it.